welcome to the latest or second webcast of a series from the Craig Biroch Business Decelerator. And uh, my name is Gib Bullock. I am going to be hosting you today. And I am one of a group of people behind this slightly uh, wacky initiative. Um, just very briefly, and hopefully I can move the slides forward. Who am I? Oh my goodness, there's a, a picture of me in casual, casual mode. I go by this nickname of the entrepreneur. I guess that comes from a background in the corporate world where for much of my time in Accenture, the consulting company, I was trying to uh, work as a social entrepreneur inside the business, trying to create a non-profit arm, or as I prefer to call it, a not-for-loss arm. And uh, that's called Accenture Development Partnerships. There may be some people uh, on this call from there. And this notion of actually trying to um, transform business bottom up to uh, change business and, and, and pivot business towards purpose is something that is very close to my heart. And it's also very much related to what I and we are trying to do with this concept of business deceleration. Which leads me to, again, a little bit of uh, context on business deceleration and what we're going to be doing today. I'll tell you uh, what this idea is in terms of simple words and um, so that you have that context. And then I will introduce you to some of our great speakers that we have who are involved in this initiative and who are going to talk about the theme that we have today or the question for the webinar, which is how can good mental health and well-being drive innovation? in business. Business is very much focused on innovation. It has some challenges around the well-being and mental health of its employees. Are the two things linked? We will discuss. Open space for discussion. I hope that we can have some participation as well. So while you're on mute at the moment, which I'm grateful for to keep this nice and, and quiet, I hope you will come off mute and, and join uh, and, and give your views or feel free to send comments uh, through uh, in terms of uh, additional questions and with the uh, help of Nick, my colleague, he will hopefully flag up these questions and I can go out to him and uh, ask. So don't hesitate, don't be shy. We can make this a little bit interactive. Towards the end, I'll talk uh, a bit about the pilot that we're running next, uh, next month on the island of Butte, which is in Scotland where I grew up. And that might be something that some of you uh, will appeal to. It might be that some of you are actually already signed up to go to that. So we can talk a bit about that and then we'll close off the webinar. I'll try and get closed at the original time, even though we're starting a little bit late, I'll try not to overrun. So without further ado, I will move on to this concept of deceleration. The logo there, which um, my, my mother says looks like a joint of uh, ham or something like that, it's not meant to be. It is in fact referring to a ancient standing stone. That stone has been standing for about 4,000 years in a field next to a farm called Craig Beeroch on the island of Butte, which is just on the west coast of Scotland. Very easy to get to actually um, in the, the Firth of Clyde. And it's the place where I spent my first 18 years and have returned to very frequently. That pile of uh, bricks at the moment, I recently bought and have the idea that it's going to transform into something that will look a little bit more like that. That's an artist or architect's impression of a building. Why am I doing this? Well, it's to create what I'm terming a business decelerator. So everything in business, as we know, is all about going faster and, and bigger and more profitable. And we're running very fast, working 50, 60 hours a week to achieve business results that are measured quarter by quarter. My sense is that perhaps we might want to actually slow down. And the, the way to actually accelerate transformation in business might actually be to begin by slowing down, to think about not so much about what we're doing in the moment, but where we're actually going as a business. I have a firm belief that business can transform uh, the world and impact the world positively. Uh, it certainly has impacts negative as well, but I believe we can have a lot more positive impacts in business. But if we want to change the world through business, we need to change the world of business, transform business. And that I think starts with transforming ourselves, which goes to the heart of what we're trying to do with business deceleration. Connect people through the power of music and art and uh, 
improv, comedy and community and even nature as well, because it's a, a beautiful island, getting people out of their day-to-day -day bubble, out of the always connected to technology. And I hope most of you are here, fully here, as opposed to multitasking and doing your emails on the side. Be fully here, be fully present. And what we want to do is get people into that innovation space. So don't see this as deceleration, as time off, chill out for uh, people who maybe are a little bit um, uh, work shy. This is about really breakthrough innovation and getting to where we can reimagine business as it, how, how it could be rather than how it is. I have a great cast of people, and I use the word cast because it's more a performing troupe, if you will, of people who will be supporting this effort. And some of them are on the line Today, I hope, uh, a couple were joining late. Uh, I know one from Canada uh, was joining late, but let me do some introduce, introductions. Um, is Alex on the line yet? Alex, if you are, maybe I can let you introduce yourself. And I am here. Good. Excellent. So thank you for having me. I'm actually a uh, light bit behind me. So I'm in nature. I thought it would be appropriate to be in nature. Um, I'm literally driving back from Basel where I've just been to pick up my car. Um, and I won't explain why I went to Basel to pick up my car. So I'm an artist, an extreme artist. I paint in extreme locations. So uh, what are extreme locations? Nature, tops of mountains. Basically where things change very, very fast. And you may say, well, how is that related to business? Well, things change very quickly in business. And um, what I've observed painting in extreme locations, when it snows, when it rains, when the wind blows, is that it's still possible to be creative everywhere. In fact, you need that tension outside of yourself in order to push back against something. And what I've taught myself how to do is to paint and create and be creative in any location. And then I bring those insights to working with individuals, teams, and organizations to help them unlock their ability, the artist inside them, so that they create better innovation, they create better strategy, they unlock the potential within themselves and within their organizations to make a difference in the world. So a lot of the work I do is around coaching, running retreats, and uh, working with individuals or teams to do something which is better for the planet. So that's me. Thank you, Alex, and welcome from uh, nature, where, where, where you are. I'll move on to the, the next slide, uh, which uh, the, the nickname, uh, Alex gets the artist, uh, Delphine gets the horse whisperer. Delphine, you're in France, I think, somewhere? Same, Renz. Thank you, Gib, for your invitation. Um, so I'm Delphine, Delphine de Picaron. I am a neuroscientist and executive coach and uh, hypnotherapist. And studying human and human intelligence, I discovered um, that animal intelligence is a powerful source of inspiration and development for humans. I continued my research in the healthcare industry, where we were testing in patients new molecules that were good candidates to cure different mental conditions like depression, schizophrenia, or Alzheimer's disease. And still in R&D, I contributed to the implementation of a new culture and ecosystem fostering innovation. And for the past 10 years, I've been accompanying executives, teams and organizations to reinvent themselves. And in this context, I offer coaching facilitated by horses or dolphins to foster executives a reconnection to their true nature and full potential. That's it. <laughs> Brilliant, Delphine. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And um, we have some good news and, and, and bad news, actually. I think Ariana may be um, ill and not able to join us today, um, but I, I, I'll, I'll see if she does join uh, a bit later. But uh, we may have a bonus in having another Avenger, the guru, Peter Koenig. I think you've managed to come in by Canada, which uh, you didn't expect to be able to do. Peter, are you, are you there? You're on mute, maybe, Peter. Oh, can you unmute yourself? I'll try and unmute you. Hmm. There's a mute button in the bottom left-hand corner, perhaps. 
<laughs> oh dear. I think, um, sorry, Peter, you can obviously hear me, but um, uh, yeah, okay, sorry about that. We, um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, I'll move on, uh, and hopefully we can sort out the audio afterwards. That's a pity. Thank you for joining. Um, so Ariana is um, going to be with us in uh, November. She's a yoga therapist and uh, again very relevant to this uh, don't think ariana is uh, is on just now in which case why don't i jump forward straight into the question so i'll stop sharing my screen at the moment and get back to the main screen and hopefully we can then uh, maybe start with this question i mean alex maybe i go back to you first of all um in nature and uh, you know art Clearly, that's probably affected your own um, well-being and, and um, mental well-being, but also creativity and innovation, this kind of theme of, of innovation that business wants so much. I mean, can you sort of, you know, what's your perspective on the question? So um, I have a question for the audience. Um, and the question is really simple. If you think about the best three decisions you've ever made in your life, and that could be taking a job, could be moving home, could be getting married, could be having children, whatever it is, the best three decisions you've ever made in your entire life. And then think about the moment that you made that decision. Go right to the moment you made the decision. Did you make the decision with your head or did you make it with your heart? Did you make it with your intellect or did you make it with your intuition? So I've, I've asked this question of hundreds of people all over the world, different age groups, different cultures, different backgrounds. And here's what I've discovered. 99% of people make the best decisions that they ever make with their heart. They don't have all the information in order to be able to make the best decision. So how does that link to mental health? Well, when we think about mental, we normally think about the mind. We normally think about this thing. And yet if our best decisions are made with this thing, maybe we're not thinking with the right thing. A few minutes ago, I said that I was driving. I've literally just stopped. In fact, I was just controlled by the Swiss police, believe it or not. As I was literally jumping on this call, they, they literally came up to me and, and asked me my identity papers, which I guess happens in Switzerland. But driving is, is interesting as well, because we are all on a journey in our life. And most of us seem to be driving a little bit too fast. Most of us seem to be having a little bit too much information coming in. And if you think about it, many of us are driving far too quickly. And some of us end up breaking down. What happens when you drive a car, particularly a manual car, and you over rev the engine, is ultimately the engine breaks down. If I was to drive my car in second gear at 100 miles an hour and do that for four hours, at some point, the engine would break down. And yet that seems to be what we do in life. We seem to drive a car at 100 miles an hour in second gear and then hope that somehow we're going to be okay that somehow we're going to survive. And yet somehow we don't. So what, how do you get out of second gear? Well, there are many other gears in a car. We have third gear, we have fourth gear, we have fifth gear. There are also many other gears in our brain. When you're born, your brain produces different brain waves. In fact, from the age of zero to two, you produce delta brain waves. From the age of two to six, you produce theta brainwaves. From the age of six to 12, you produce alpha brainwaves. And from the age of 12 onwards, you produce beta brainwaves. Why am I telling you all this? Because if you are in beta brainwaves for the entire day, you're going to end up breaking down. It's as simple as that. How do you get into alpha, which is what you were at between six and 12, or theta or delta? Well, there are four ways to do it. The first way is to sleep. When you fall asleep, you get a decent night's sleep, you go from theta to alpha, then theta, then delta, which is deep sleep. Second way is through hypnosis, which we just heard about. When in hypnosis, you get into theta or delta. Third way is through meditation. When you meditate, you get into theta or delta. And the fourth way is be doing what you really, really love, when you get into flow. So when I'm painting in the mountains, I'm getting into theta or delta. Now, where do the best ideas come from? They also come from when we get 
out of beta. When we get out of second gear, we get into four, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, or sixth gear. And you know that your best ideas, your best decisions come in those moments. So how do we do that? How do we get into those different gears? Well, flow is one way of doing it. But you have to take a break. You have to stop. I've literally stopped driving. And what the decelerator is about, which is what Gibbs talked about a little bit at the beginning, is how do we all stop? How do we all take that break? So we get out of second gear, we stop the car, we stop trying to move so fast, we give our minds a break. And at that moment, different ideas can come through. Those ideas are the seeds of innovation. So let me stop there and see if there are any comments, questions, or maybe we're gonna wait to the end for those. Good. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Alex. I've got the chat uh, uh, up on my uh, screen here. And again, I invite people to, to feel free to reflect or, or comment or put your hand up in some way. Um, the brain waves are, are, are moving there. And when you talk about um, meditation and uh, hypnosis and sleeping as well, I mean, I, I should turn to the neuroscientist, uh, Delphine. To, does any of that resonate with you, Delphine? And, and also how the kind of connection with animals that you're so interested in and passionate in how that relates uh, to this whole thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's mixed to me, of course, of the different uh, state of consciousness and uh, how we can have this discussion between our mental, um, verbal, cognitive mind and the body, the somatic mind, and how we can, in this discussion, uh, rely on animal intelligence, our own instincts, our intuition, and the different organs intelligence. You spoke about the heart, the gut, and uh, our somatic intelligence. So it speaks uh, a lot uh, to me. And the connection, of course, to the nature and our true nature is very important. And I think um, it's, it, um, for me, um, innovation, uh, if I define it as a new idea that takes form as a better, a solution uh, like device or service. Uh, I believe that today um, it is the responsibility of innovators to adopt a systemic view and produce sustainable innovation with a friendly social and ecological impact. And for that, I think that nature or the connection with animals is very, very helpful. I didn't see any animals this, um, destroying their own ecosystem and just humans. So um, I think it's very, very important. As far as mental health, I, I believe it affects how we think, feel and act. So your question is very important for me because it brings together two domains that I, I'm exploring in the context of my accompaniments in the corporations. And um, uh, mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and uh, social well-being. And what best condition than being in a good mental health to innovate? I think this is a prerequisite to innovation. And it sounds obvious, for, but the reality in cooperation is very different. Um, do you know that one in six employees are currently experiences, experiencing mental health problems? Uh, like anxiety, depression, personal disorder, etc. So it's for me, it's a lot. So our mental health affects how we feel about our jobs, how well we perform, how well we interact with colleagues, customers, clients, how well we can empathize with them, which is very important in innovation, as you know. And staying in positive mental health allows us to realize our full potential. What you said, Alexander, cope with the pressures of life, work productively, have positive relationships, make good choices. And there are very important skills for innovation. And many factors are important to preserve good mental health, like having clear job roles, which is not always the case in the corporations, responsive line managers, uh, LC approach to diet and exercise, sleeping well, drinking less alcohol, no smoking, etc. It's very, very simple. But imagine. I, I agree with most of that there, apart from the bit about the drinking less alcohol. <laughs> up, to that, up to that point, I was. Probably, I was probably but we can drink whiskey, of course. <laughs> yeah. 
sorry, I interrupted you. Were, you were just, uh, you were, you were, you were going to say. <laughs> so just imagine a second, a culture of both innovation and good mental health where everyone can innovate, failure is accepted, and each employee feels comfortable with speaking about that mental health condition. And managers know what pressures employees are under and ensure this doesn't lead to stress. The pressure and stress are some aspects I work with my coaches in presence of horses or wild dolphin. And if you come to Butte and to, if you attend to the seminar, which I hope, you will experience it yourself. Horses are very sensitive to tension and they avoid tension. And so you need to put the correct amount of pressure to obtain what you want from the horse, to partner with the horse. And it is exactly the same with humans. Um, and maybe you have uh, experienced that, Gib. Um, so my question is, what about a culture enabling a sustainable innovation, championing good mental health and providing a greater understanding for how to help those who need more support? What, what do you think? Excellent. No, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more uh, in terms of the, the culture of it's a taboo subject still, as we know, within uh, within business, and and the problem is that if it stays a taboo subject, then there is going to be this inhibition, uh, sorry, this this um, restriction on innovation. I suppose that we don't see it will, you know, you can't diagnose it; it won't appear in a KPI. But um, if you're saying one in six people are, are affected, and I think that's probably a conservative number in terms of the people. I speak to, um, then there is a an opportunity being missed. We are not awakening people, and they're also people are disconnected. And I think there is a link between that disconnection that people are feeling and that symptom, which is poor mental health. I'd love to come back on a few of these these things. I th I think we may have fixed Peter, or Peter may have fixed his own audio, but um, uh, I'm going to check. Peter, can you try speaking? Yes, I'll try. Can you ah, hear me? We have you. Okay, so maybe maybe 30 seconds of introduction that you missed and then, you know, do you want to come in on any of what's been said already and give your own take? Well, well thank you. Thank you, Gib, and thank you all so far. Very articulate, um, my predecessors. Uh, just briefly on me, I've been working on developing conscious tools, tools of consciousness for the last 35 years, uh, particularly to accelerate development processes. And the, the biggest accelerator I found was uh, the relationship to money. So uh, this is a very taboo subject. And I've been developing processes and tools to help people become conscious of what money does to them and what they do with, with their money um, individually and with organizations. And then further tools to uh, investigate and propagate how to materialize projects, initiatives, and of course, companies as well, uh, enterprises, how to materialize as easily and as well possible uh, what, your, what your deepest dreams are. So actually, it's not so much a, a tool for development as a description. I've interviewed thousands of entrepreneurs now to, to see how they how each one goes about it. And I found there's a pattern of how we all realize our projects when they realize well. So that's basically uh, what I've been up to. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to go into sort of free flow now and just, uh, again, we're in open, open space um, uh, for a little bit more time. We won't have a lot of time to discuss things, but anything that uh, either people want to ask questions from the of, of the panelists. I, I have a kind of question I wanted to come back to Delphine when you talked about animals not destroying their own uh, environments and we must look pretty crazy to, to animals as they watch what we are doing to, to the planet and our shared system. But what about mental health and, the, you know, and innovation? I mean, uh, when it comes to the animal kingdom, there's a lot of innovation goes on there and this concept of biomimicry as well, I suppose, is, yes. is actually a tool in innovation. Yeah, yeah, but that's what Alexander uh, speak about. It's the 
it, the, the inspiration you can have from the nature and the biomimicry is, is a, an example. And there is some innovation in animals. There are some different cultures of innovation, but they are not as uh, important as humans. We are not developed the same way. But uh, when we can look at the nature and the way the nature um, is so abundant and brings so much things, um, there are many, many things like um, design, different design, maybe even car designs that are found their inspiration on eagles, the, the way they fly, etc. So for humans, looking at the nature is very, very, very inspirational for, for innovation. Yeah. That resonate with you, Alex, in terms of be, being out there at the moment in the in nature. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think nature is is one of the best teachers in the world. Um, it's it's an incredibly powerful teacher. That in children, um, we think that we teach children. Actually, t children teach us. And if you go back to what Peter was saying about consciousness, and you follow the theory that consciousness is constantly rising, that means that the children that are being born today have a higher consciousness than us. And the way to validate that is to check with your parents. Do you think you have a higher consciousness than your parents or a lower consciousness? Do you think you have a higher consciousness then you'll probably follow that theory. And our children also have a higher level of consciousness. So they come in, we think we're there to teach them. Actually, they're there to teach us. We may teach them about maths and science and you know, the external world, but they teach us about the internal world and they'll show us the things that uh, we need to learn. They're like perfect mirrors. And, and on that note, um, talking about consciousness. I'm thinking, I'd, I'm thinking I'd love to... that, Alex, sorry to interrupt. I'm just thinking, you know, Greta Thunberg is probably the, the best example. I mean, she's not just teaching. Well, that, yeah. Him, but, you know. mean, if, you, if you take Greta and you, you, you look at that stare between Greta and, and Donald Trump at uh, the UN General Assembly back in September, therein lies the challenge we have in the planet. In that single look, they literally look like they're on different planets. Why? Because they are. They are operating on an entirely different level of consciousness. So how do you um, create innovation today that's going to have positive impact? You need to step into a different world. How do you do that? You do exactly what Peter was talking about, which is elevate consciousness. And I'd love to come back to Peter because he gave us a wonderful introduction. And I'm now intrigued to hear about what Peter's going to say about the link between consciousness and innovation, consciousness and mental health. So on that note, Peter, if you can unmute yourself, maybe I can, uh, can bring you back in because I, I want to know. I want to know what you're going to say about that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Is that okay, Gib? Shall I carry on? Please do. I'm, 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 just, well, I'm taking myself out of this and uh, please speak away, free flow, and ask questions, people. I've just been... Um, for the last week, uh, listening to a few videos uh, on um, in an online summit called uh, Collective Trauma. I don't know if any of you have, um, but it was very interesting. Pe the, the, the mentors there like Ken Wilbur and, and Peter Levine. Um, and the point everybody was making is actually virtually, there is virtually no human on the planet that hasn't been tra traumatized. Of course, this is their particular field, but I think if we're talking about mental health, you know, it's so popular now to start talking about business leaders as psychopaths and so forth. Well, don't just focus on the business leaders. Somewhere we're all in a phase of development and it's just a question of degree. And this is where the consciousness comes in because we've all got, we can call ourselves all mentally healthy or all mentally ill if we like. And it's interesting that this subject is appearing now in the business world. But I think um, for the big questions that we are facing now um, globally, uh, the, the bottom line for, for, for everybody in my view is, is consciousness, to develop uh, our consciousness to new levels. And this is where I've been you know, putting my, staking my gamble for the last 35 years, um, but not to try and save the planet or anything, or even to try and save myself. It, in a sense, it's because I've got nothing better to do. I came to the point where there was really, and I, what I feel is that it's a win, 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 win situation for everybody if we do that. And, you know, either we're going to answer these big questions, which go beyond the question of innovation, 
in business. Um, but um, either we, we answer these big questions or we go extinct. This seems to be the choice right now. But even if we go extinct, at least we go out in a good way if we're focusing on our consciousness. So that's been my gamble. And just coming back to the subject of uh, innovation and Festina Lente, as Gibbs mother calls it, which means hasten slowly, hurry up slowly. Um, I did that in the introduction actually, yes. Exactly. Oh, thank you, yes. yes. So, you know, I think this is, this is key. I'm trying to do this. I'm just in Canada right now today. And I've been very conscious of this since joining the decelerator program, because I think that, you know, none of us can really go to, to Craig Birach and, and talk about um, what we're doing and, and be with Gib if we're not really actively really doing this to start off with. We don't really have a role to play unless we're integrating this subject while we're talking about it. So I've been trying to do that. It's not that easy, actually, because what we're all at some level on the hamster wheel. And, we, and to be innovate, you've got to get off the hamster wheel. And I think this is what, I think this is what Delphine is offering, what you are, uh, Alexander, are offering, what we're all offering in a, with our different media is, is um, an effort at, at helping ourselves and at the same time helping other people to get off the hamster wheel because I'm, while we're on the hamster wheel, we don't have any chance to innovate. We're just on the hamster wheel. So that's totally... So I'm, I'm thinking of biomimicry and, and probably hamsters on the wheel is what we are imitating and it's, it's probably not, a, not <laughs> the best choice to imitate. But I'm also, thank you, Peter. I'm, I'm conscious of time, but also I want to, um, Nick, I believe there's a question uh, has come in. Um, do you want to share that? Yeah, sure. This is a question from Rennie. Thanks for uh, putting it through. So I'm just going to read it out. Uh, the mental health of unemployed people seems to accelerate in a downward spiral. How can we provide a space within employability work to give opportunity for innovation and improved mental health? Thanks for the question, Rennie. That's open to the rest of the panel. Great question. I'm going to throw it open to, uh, to, to people, anyone who wants to come back on that. You can read it in the bottom corner if you didn't get all of that. Wow. Uh, that's okay. an amazing question, Rennie. Um, yeah, it is a downward spiral. Um, and I'm going to come back to something Peter said earlier. So if you're unemployed, what is the big thing that you're going to end up focusing on? Well, maybe your health, maybe trying to get a job, maybe trying to keep your relationship together. But the big thing that you're really going to be thinking about is money. The bottom line is you're going to be saying, okay, where's my next paycheck going to come from? How am I going to earn more money? And once you start on that spiral, then it's going to start to impact everything else because it's going to impact your emotional health. You're going to be worrying about it. And then it can start to impact your physical health. And then it can start to impact everything else, your love life, your, your sense of meaning, your sense of value in the world. So how do you change that? Well, you have to go to the source of the problem. What is the source of the problem? Most of us deal with the symptom. You know, if I cut my leg open really badly in the mountains, then I want a doctor to look at it and sew it up if necessary. I'd also want the doctor and expect the doctor look at it and say well you know what i think you bruised that pretty badly it needs to go for an x you need to go for an x-ray takes me for an x-ray she takes me for an x-ray and i re she realizes the leg's broken you would expect the doctor also to put the leg in a cast what you wouldn't expect the doctor to do but what is required to do today is for her to send me to an osteopath and say look i think alexander the real reason that you fell over is because you were off balance and an osteopath is going to look at the way you balance. And indeed, the osteopath puts me on two scales. There's, look, there's five kilos more on one scale than the other scale. Your hips are out of alignment with your spine. That is the root cause. So you know, how do you fix uh, that kind of problem? You have to go back to the source, which is really what I hear people talking about. What is going to be the source of that? Relationship to money. It's always going to go back to something like that. Ultimately, what's behind the, the, the relationship to money? Relationship to value. Relationship to how much we value ourselves, how much we accept ourselves, how much we love ourselves. That's pretty deep. What's the, what's the, the solution? 
raise the energy. How do you raise energy? By releasing the block, which is stop key. So that would be my response. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit deeper than you were it, expecting. No, I think it's a, I think it's a good response, but I have to probably um, well either um, Peter or Delphine, who I know you know Peter in particular, we talk about money and source, which is your area. Delphine, are you uh, you're trying to speak there? I'll take you off mute. Oh, I can't take you off mute. Can you take yourself off mute? I think that isolation is the enemy of mental health. So go to the community, connect with the community. And the recommendation is to go to Public Health England uh, website where you will find uh, some toolkits and ideas um, to answer your question. So it's very short, but uh, I recommend yeah, you visit Public Health England. It's very, very nice. Okay. Uh, and, and Peter, any... Um... Yes, I just give a, a little thank you for those comments so far. Just a little background thought. Um, I wrote an article in, after much reflection in 1997 called Fighting Unemployment, Is It Intelligent? And I came to the conclusion that we should all be going for 30% 30, 30 unemployment actually would be a good target and go higher because the jobs that everybody is looking for are all, um, let's, let's call it hamster wheel jobs still. They're repetitive, mainly repetitive and not creative jobs. So Rainey, I don't know if you're in that position, but whoever is, has created space for themselves and a space to, be, to, to redesign themselves and do what they actually love in life. Now, you know, that sounds challenging. And, and as Alexander was saying, well, you know, where's the money coming from and so forth. But money is just one of the resources. And if you look at your life, and people don't tend to do this, has, has the universe or has life ever let you down in terms up to this point, in terms of resources? I mean, you're, you have somewhere to sleep, you have something to eat, and everything else in your life. If you look back in your whole life, has the universe ever let you down? Now, if the answer is no, you've always had whatever you really needed in the moment, why should the new universe stop supplying you tomorrow? What are the chances that it'll do that? So this is just a, like a supporting thought, that, and particularly, uh, this support will get stronger if you really start to look at what you love doing in life and start doing it. Then you'll get off all your worries about money or whatever else you may be worrying about because you start to just get on to loving more and more and more of what you're doing. And the money will come or it won't come, but it won't be a problem because you'll be doing, you'll be energizing yourself and you'll be energizing everybody else around you with what you love doing. So that's basically uh, a solution to another level. Good, 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 good reflections. I'm conscious of, of time here uh, at the moment. I, I would allow, if, if Rini wants to uh, respond on that, either on the text or whatever, I won't put you on the spot, Rini, but um, um, I, I'm going to sort of round off. I'm, I'm going to contradict myself and go five minutes over because we started five minutes late and a lot of people will be watching this in the recording. So you're getting your full 45 minutes uh, on the recording. Um, before I move just to the sort of close out and the summary of what we're actually going to be doing when we're together um, decelerating in Scotland, I'll ask for a kind of quick tweet length um, comment uh, from each of the, the, the speakers, uh, maybe just a quick sort of summary of any last final thoughts and then I'll, I'll move back to my, my uh, agenda and slides and close out. So why don't I go back to um, a tweet from, uh, from from you, Alex, and then Delphine, and then Peter, and then we'll go. I'm going to pick up on something Peter just said there, which is really, I think, the theme of the decelerator. If you are unemployed, you have a chance to take a break. In that space, you can recreate the life that you really want to live. And all of us were born to create something. Excellent. Good tweet. Del Delphine, you uh, want to follow? Answer the, the question, I believe that mental health uh, can drive innovation and sustainable innovation. That's it. It's possible. 
I would concur with that. Um, Peter, any? Uh... Well, let, let me follow on from what Alexander said, but be even provocative with it. I believe that if you're not really doing what you want in life, um, particularly at the level, if you're watching this, because you're at, already at a level of consciousness to be able to watching, to be able to watch this. If you're not right now doing what you love in your life, you're cheating yourself and you're cheating me and you're cheating everybody because you're not doing what you were born for and why you came here from the start. So I, I, I let that in as a beautiful provocation for you if you're on the hamster wheel still. Thank you. Great provocation, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, uh, I'm going to now turn just to close out um, in the last couple of minutes. I'll compress this down. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, the decelerator, decelerator Launch Lab, easy for me to say. You can see some lovely pictures of uh, that is actually Aaron in the background, uh, which you can see very well from, from Butte. And um, 18th to 22nd of November, only about three weeks away. If some of this stuff appeals to you that we've been talking about, don't expect it to be easy. It's going to be a bit challenging. You can tell from our speakers. There's others that haven't been uh, uh, on today that uh, were on the last webinar, but we will be having this um, week, which will be, yes, uh, a busy week, but not so busy. I'll, I'll let you sort of look at that on the, on the screen, but we will be arriving on the Monday afternoon, so you can travel in the morning on Monday, get to Scotland, quite close to, 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 to Glasgow, and then a, a short train, and then a, a ferry journey. And then we'll be starting up in the first afternoon by setting some context. I'm very keen for people to arrive, and they will be arriving from very different backgrounds. We've got people from many different companies like Standard Chartered and Deloitte's and, um, uh, gosh, um, Givaudan and many other companies. There's also some NGO people, and there's also going to be, I'm very pleased to say, some people from the Butte community. So we will have a mixture of old and young, young people like me, old people uh, older than me, and um, a real diverse group of, of, of people. Um, we will, the bulk of the week will be in breakouts where you will have a chance to really hands-on um, experience and see working with Alex, what Alexander, what that's like in terms of art and creating. We're not going to teach you to paint pretty pictures. We're going to and think Alex is going to be teaching to create. Same with improv innovation. Same with what Delphine's going to be doing with um, with the, the horse coaching. Um, we'll have a former Special Forces soldier talking about taking us out into nature and walking in nature. What can that learn us as we've been talking about before? There's a little word down there called space or, or ma. Ma is the Japanese word for intentional space. And that's going to be important. It looks like a busy week there, but there will also be a chance for you to reflect and think and breaks as well. We'll also have evening events and, and dinners right up to uh, the last night where there will be a Scottish Cayley with some real Scottish music before we bring it together on the last day, um, where we'll actually sort of be thinking about how this actually um, how you can actually take this forward into your day jobs or into your life so that it's not just something you do for a week uh, and then forget about it, but it actually goes with you. And then we release people on the Friday afternoon. So it's going to be a super fun week, uh, an eventful week. I feel very fortunate by the, the cast of people that we've got uh, coming along. Um, the mornings, that's the detailed agenda, which um, you won't have a chance to read at the moment, but uh, can be sent out to you. But um, the mornings are with yoga and some meditation. Lunches are long and uh, a chance to be out in nature. And then um, we have breaks before the, the evening sessions. So that's what's uh, coming up. It only uh, uh, leaves me to thank all the speakers today. I thought it was another uh, fabulous and uh, engaging session. Thank you to the people who joined us live. Thank you to those of you who are watching the replay. And um, if you are interested, do contact me or contact or get onto the Craig Beard website. You've got the spelling. And um, sign up if you if you want to come along. I don't think you'll regret it. So with that, I uh, take off my uh, screen and say goodbye. And uh, I will stop the recording. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend.